well done. You made it. Welcome to the Zoom room. I was just explaining to Chris that I've spent my working life involved with the heritage of Wales and um, I worked for the Pembrokeshire Museums and then for the National Museum of Wales and for the National Trust and also latterly I was had my own consultancy dealing with the heritage and tourism in Wales. So I've had the privilege of being able to explore these fantastic sites in Wales for the past 50 years or more. I specialised in the industrial history, so most of the slides that you'll be seeing today refer to the 18th and 19th centuries, although I will be expanding, expanding the chronological boundaries. So here we have industrial Wales, and it can only be a backwards glimpse. I can only show you some aspects because the subject is so huge and so involved. So just let's kick off with, oops, with Paris Mountain. This amazing excavation, this massive open cast excavation at Paris Mountain on Anglesey near the port of Amluch. And in fact, Amluch was a port that uh, provided the outlet for the copper ore that was dug in this incredible mountain. Copper was being mined here, well, it was being mined in North Wales during the prehistoric period and the mines at the Great Orme near Llandidno are uh, really very, very good examples of prehistoric mining. But this period with Amluch was really from the 18th and the 19th century. And this huge open cast was excavated by hand, of course. It was excavated by picks, shovels, um, explosives, and the techniques they used for getting the ore up to the surface, ready for transportation down to Amluch, was via these incredible flimsy stages I think these are more flimsy than they actually were. The artist is a little bit of sensationalism here, I think. But nevertheless, this was the process that they used to haul the ore up to the top of the surface and then transport it away. Two men operating the windlass and a man being raised and lowered on the bucket. And this upper painting shows us the, the lines, the ropes going down into the bottom of the pit. It was a place where men and, men and women worked alongside each other. And the copper ladies, as they were known, uh, these did very, very difficult work in the open air mainly, although sometimes they had rough, crude shelters to protect against the worst of the weather. But these were the people who actually broke the ore bearing rock, broke it down into smaller pieces under powder. And they used that by using 12 pound, up to 12 pound in weight, uh, hand hammers, and then their left hand was covered, was uh, protected rather, by a gauntlet, which was made out of iron plates, and they worked 12-hour shifts for sixpence a day, and that was their job working at Paris Proper Mountain. So we have these incredible landscapes dotted across Wales. Another amazing landscape is the landscape of the Denorwood quarries at Llanberis. This was part of the major slate quarrying industry that hit its peak in 1898 when 17,000 men and boys actually produced half a million tons of slate. And Welsh slate was just absolutely superb and was uh, sent to the literally to the four corners of the world. This view of the um, Dinorwa quarries, well, it's absolutely astonishing. And I hope you can see my arrow working, but you can see the techniques that they used for quarrying was to open up great steps, climbing into the mountainside. Each one of these quarry faces being about 60 foot, they varied between 80, uh, 40 and 80 feet high, but about 60 feet high. Some of them, however, were much, much higher. There, is, um, uh, there are a couple of faces there which are 120 feet high. And then, so they worked the quarry in these steps, the slate was then taken out by the various tram roads to this incredible system of balance operated inclines. And then the tram roads progressed further to dump the waste slate 
all around the sides of the mountains. And you will find slate quarries like this dotted all across North Wales. We were just, Simon and I were just talking a moment ago about the uh, quarrying museum in Llanberis. If you really want to get an understanding of what slate quarrying was all about, visit that museum. It's just an astonishing place full of the most incredible machinery with a, a 50 foot, five inch diameter water wheel providing the power. And I was very privileged that when I first joined the National Museum in 1970, I was given the job of actually opening that museum, which um, took place in 1972. Anyway, back to the quarrying. Quarrying was, these were fantastically skilled people who actually were involved with quarrying the slate and breaking it down into the sizes and then dressing it, as it was called. They worked on these quarrying faces. Slate is this wonderful commodity, and North Welsh slate is particularly superb in this regard, that it can be cut at a plane which is not coincidental with its bedding plane. So they can produce, as you can see on the right-hand photograph, these large blocks of slate, which were chiseled, barred out, and then thrown down to the quarry floor, and then taken to long lines open-sided sheds, which were called walia, and in there the men were working to actually reduce the slate and dress it. So here we have a view of these uh, walia. I think this was taken at the Dinorowick quarry. All winds, all weathers, it didn't matter a damn, you worked on the, the quarry face and you worked in the, in the walia. And here we can see the three main processes that were used in actually reducing slate. The block has been reduced down to a manageable size, and now we have somebody splitting it into, and normally they were about two inch thick blocks, which are then passed to the, this gentleman here, who's using two broad, break, broad bladed chisels and um, a wooden headed hammer. And it was his job then to split the slate thin enough then to be used as an important roofing material. Then it passed over to this gentleman here who's working on this bench with this sharp edge here and using a cranked handled knife is actually cutting the slate to size, producing as they did so, a natural chamfer on the underside of the slate, was, which was so very important. Now, if you went to the museum, if you sorry, if you went to a quarry in the 19th or 20th century, you wouldn't order 2022 by 10s or 16 by 14s or whatever it was, you would go there and you would order 2000 ladies, or you might even have a couple of duchesses or a few princesses, because all these slate sizes were given particular names and you could have narrow ladies and broad ladies. So next time you go to the builder's merchant, when you want some slate, you want to go along and ask if you can have a couple of thousands of broad queens and see what their reply is going to be. Slate, of course, could only function properly, the slate industry rather, could only function properly as long as you had excellent means of transportation. And we know that North Wales is renowned for its great little railways. Most of them, I think, in fact, all of them in the Northwest were built to serve the slate industry. And this port, Porth Madog, was the most important slate exporting port. Um, huge quantities of slate were shipped out from the quays here and literally shipped to the four corners of the world. And in addition to it being a very important slate exporting port, it was also an important boat building area as well. And the boats that carried the slate across the oceans they were once described by a maritime historian as the Western Ocean racers. They were such good quality boats. Porth Madoc's origin begins here with this structure, which is the cob. And the cob is an embankment that was built by William Maddox, who was a, a, a landowner who came from Boston in Lincolnshire in England. And he came across and it was part of a massive land reclamation scheme for the whole of all the flatlands around Avon Glaslyn. He completed it in uh, 1812, and it was a wonderful piece, a magnificent piece of engineering. In doing so, however, diverted the flow of the river around this rocky outcrop 
just here. And then the flow of the river scoured out the seaward approaches, which allowed the ocean going ships access into the port of Port Madog. In 18, 1836, the Festiniog Railway was built to connect with the huge slate quarries in Bliner Festiniog, originally operated by um, horse and by gravity, then by the 1860s, of course, the famous Festiniog Steam Railway was opened. So a very important, those slate quarries and slate mines very, very dependent upon their port outlets. And there are some places where the landscapes of Wales are quite extraordinary. Um, here we are at Halkin Mountain, just south of Hollywell in northwest Wales, a place where lead has been mined. Well, we know that, and the Romans were mining lead. They're certainly very active during the medieval period when lead was used for the roofs of castles and churches, etc. And in the 18th and 19th century again. And I find this photograph just absolutely astonishing because it looks more like a battlefield but it is in fact a whole series of small pits and if you look very closely you can see vaguely the way that these pits almost run in lines following the actual strike of the lead bearing oars amazing wonderful place <clears throat> but if you go to the heart of rural Carmarthenshire there you, you will find one of the most extraordinary examples of prehistoric and Roman mining at Dolai Coffee, just north of Llandavri. And the aerial view here shows the actual site. Here in the trees, you can just see this massive open cast pit from which they excavated uh, gold. And then the landscape still bears traces of that industry from all those centuries ago. The Romans were there between AD 45 and the end of the fourth century. But you can see traces of the water outlets. You can see where the spill has been placed. And it is remarkable. They searched for <clears throat> the natural joints in the rock where the hot magma from far below the Earth's crust was pushed up through and deposited the valuable ore bearing um, material. And then they excavated tunnels. These were all hand cut and the thousands and thousands and thousands of pick marks uh, that they used, the picks that they used to open up these tunnels. Another technique that they used was actually fire setting. And this is a view from a publication called Dere Metallica, which was published in 1556 by Georgius Agricola. And he depicts it here, how they, would set fires against the rock faces underground, heat up the rock to as high a temperature as they could possibly achieve, and then throw cold water on it. And the expansion of the rock and the rapid contraction helped shatter it and make the process of mining that much easier. Uh, there's a story which says that Walt Disney actually used this book to um, create the uh, clothes that the dwarves wore in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Don't know if that's true. The Romans built incredible systems of um, water leaks, supplying water from as far as five miles away uh, down to the actual workings. And you can see traces of these water course right the way along the landscape here. But in 1935, there was a remarkable find made uh, when at a depth of 150 feet, they discovered this portion of a Roman water raising wheel, because water is always a problem, well, in all mines. And a water, rise, water raising wheel was operated on the treadmill process. So whoever you were, you had the job of climbing up and down here, spinning the wheel, and the water was then being picked up via these buckets. You can see that this is a closed chamber right the way around the periphery of the wheel picking it up and depositing it in another water course where it would flow to yet another water wheel and another water wheel and so on. And um, they could raise about 9,000 gallons a day um, by operating this wheel. One can only just surmise of how appalling the conditions were for the people working underground, soaking wet all day, operating this treadmill. 
Dollar Coffee is located close to the small village of Pimpsaint, and Pimpsaint, which means five saints, took its name from the legend which said that five saints on a pilgrimage to St. David's rested one day on this rock which was laid flat at the time, rested their heads, and while they were resting, so a terrific hailstorm broke out, and the ferocity and velocity of the hailstones pummeled their heads into the rock, thus excavating these concavities. Well, that's a nice legend, of course, but the truth of the matter was that this was an anvil on which the ore bearing, the gold bearing rock was placed and then beaten with hammers. And it naturally wore out these concavities. And eventually, as they became too deep, roll the rock over and you can start again. I love the way that legend and uh, have fact and fiction blend together. Could I just pay tribute to the amazing, absolutely amazing World Heritage Site of Pont Casasta. This is the aqueduct that was built by Thomas Telford, completed in 1805 and carries the St. Austin Canal over the River Dee. It is an astonishing piece of engineering. It's a thousand feet long. These pillars are, I think, are 127 feet high, not all solid masonry to lighten the load. At a point, they were um, uh, hollow and just built as a, a skin to support these incredible cast iron containers, these cast iron tanks, and this continuous flow of water <coughs> carries the, the narrowboats over the, the canal. It really is quite a magnificent piece of engineering. And I'm going to stick with Thomas Telford again, uh, because he was responsible for the construction of these two great bridges across the Menai Straits. The Menai Suspension Bridge, designed by Thomas Telford, that was opened in 1826 and carried the important post road from London to Holyhead and therefore across to Dublin. So it was vitally important in terms of communication. And the amazing tubular, box tubular railway bridge that were built by the Stevensons and opened in 1850. And as you probably know, in 1970, unfortunately, this Britannia railway bridge caught fire. But it's still there. The structure is still there. It now carries a road on the top, but the great ornamental lions are still there. Amazing bridges. Lovely stories associated with the Menai Suspension Bridge. Both these bridges had to be high enough, of course, to allow passage for sailing ships. So that was a very important factor in their design. And this suspension bridge, when it was constructed and the first chains were put into position, the local newspaper carried the report which said that the, a local cobbler actually ran out along this first chain that was there. And these chains are about nine inches wide, nothing else below him. And then he repaired a pair of shoes while straddled above the, um, uh, above the, uh, the Menai Straits there. And when all the chains were in position and they had working stages across them, the Menai Bridge Silver Band went out and gave a concert from the center of the of the bridge. So I love those little stories that give a human touch to this uh, study. And thinking in terms of significance and importance, let's turn our attention to Merthyr Tydfil. Merthyr Tydfil, who was, that was described as the greatest iron manufacturing town in the world in the 1840s. This was a town of huge significance in terms of the development of industry in Britain and the rest of the world. And here we have this view of the interior of the rolling mills at Cavartha, painted by Henry Williams, showing the operatives passing these bars of red hot iron that have been heated, heated up in these ovens, passing them through, rolling out, often rolling out rails, but they also made uh, cannon. They made a whole variety of uh, stuff out of iron. Absolutely incredible. And the size and scale of these buildings, although I think the artist has over-egged it a little bit, but nevertheless, it does show and indicate the significance of that town at that time. I love the domestic detail there. I don't know if you can see it on the right-hand side, but somebody's washing is hanging out above the, um, the hot ovens to dry. And there in the background is the home of the Ironmaster family, the Crochets. That's Cabartha Castle, which was built in 1825 
at a cost of £32,000. You're talking about huge amounts of money. But Merthyr is incredible because it is the site of the first cast iron railway bridge in the world. I know the first iron bridge was in um, Iron Bridge in Shropshire in England in 1777, but this one dates from circa 1792, and it was the first railway bridge because on its surface, it carries a horse-drawn tram road, but Ponte Cavnai, the bridge of troughs, meant that it also carried a water course below it and another water course, which was on the superstructure high above it to supply water into the great Abafra ironworks. A remarkable structure made out of cast iron, yet the detailing here with the woodworking joints is just absolutely superb. And another World Heritage Site, and aren't we fortunate that we have so many in Wales, the World Heritage Site of Lynavon, Lynavon Ironworks. And here we have an example of a totally integrated ironworks, where the whole process is, can be so clearly seen from this aerial photograph. And I have to say that a lot of these aerial photographs have come from the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historic Monuments in Aberystwyth. And they've um, been taking aerial photographs of Wales of all periods of history for many years. And their collection is just absolutely superb. And here we can see this view of the ironworks long before conservation work started on it. But there are the calcining kilns where the iron ore that was obtainable locally uh, was um, burned to burn off the uh, excess water and uh, to create a workable quantity of iron that was then fed into the furnaces along with coke that was produced in local coke ovens and limestone quarried from the nearby quarries. And then the molten iron run out in troughs in these casting houses. So a whole bank of furnaces there. Workers' cottages. If you worked in those ironworks, you literally lived on the job and you were no more than a two minute walk away from your actual works. And this quite amazing structure here, you get a better view. It's a water balance lift that was built in 1848 to take the raw materials from the lower level and by a full tank of water being lowered down, raised an empty tank with the raw materials to the top and then you just reverse the process and that's how you got the materials up and down. What's important about Glynavon is its historic landscape because surrounding the works in the town is just an incredible and amazing landscape which is full. I can talk for hours about this because it's so brilliant but with watercourses the keeper's pond at the top of the Blorange that was a header tank that supplied water to reservoirs there we can see one there, which in turn operated another balance lift for the great limestone quarries here at Pushby, and then connected by a whole network of tram roads down to the town of Blynavon, and then also down to the Monmouthshire Canal at Gavilan. And so we are very fortunate that we have some amazing views of these works. This is a painting of 1840 by William Childs of the great Dowlice Works in Merthyr Tidville, which at this time was employing upwards of 10,000 men, women, and children. An astonishing works, and again, we can see the banks of furnaces, uh, the people gathering together the material that were then, there's somebody actually tipping the material into the open furnace, flaming and smoking away. Just incredible. But people had to live somewhere and people flooded in from all parts of rural Wales. They came from uh, elsewhere in Britain, they came from Ireland, and eventually they were coming from as far afield as um, Spain, etc. And accommodation could vary enormously. On the whole, it was pretty crude, although these houses, which are at Abakan in uh, Gwent, these are related to coal mining, but nevertheless, they give an idea of what housing conditions were like. But these were pretty good quality houses. In Merthyr Tidville in 1840, you could live in a cellar and uh, with one room and you could have as many, believe it or not, as 12 or 14 people living in rotation in those rooms. The conditions were absolutely appalling. But here I took this photograph in 
1975. And um, there you can see the bathroom hanging on the wall of these houses. And this delightful young lad came out and said, take my photograph, mister. So how on earth could I possibly resist? But such were the conditions in these iron towns along the heads of the valley that people there were very prone to a wide range of diseases, dysentery, scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, you name it. And of course, the horrendous outbreaks of cholera. Uh, there were four major outbreaks of cholera in the 19th century across South Wales. And even to such an extent that between Tredegar and Rumney, there's a dedicated graveyard just for cholera victims. Most of the people there died in the outbreak of 1830-39. And such were the relationships between the ironmasters and the workers that one ironmaster, Crochet Bailey, in Nantaglo, was so worried about workers' uprising and insurrection that he actually had built for them himself and his family these fireproofed towers, protective towers. There are two of them, just looking at one of them here, built in 1816 so designed that the only access was via a narrow bridge, short bridge, and through this iron wrought and cast iron door. Interesting feature about this door, if you notice, it has two apertures there and there, and therefore muskets. So if the revolting workers came charging to batter down the door, all you did was to put your muskets through those holes there and fire, and then you would disable them. You shoot them in the knees, in the um, hips, in the thighs, whatever. The point being that you disabled people and stopped the crowd getting to the doorway. So we have some fascinating insights to our social history alongside our industrial history. And then occasionally you can come across photographs like this, which just speak volumes. This is a photograph taken by, I've forgotten his name, William Chambers of Tredega in the 1860s. And it's a young woman who worked in the limestone quarries. I find this photograph deeply, deeply fascinating because here was a woman who worked in a brutal industry out in all winds and weathers. And her job was to break the rocks up into a manageable size. And you just have to take a look at her hands. These are working hands with a vengeance. She's there carrying her water jack and her food box. But what I love about this photograph is she hasn't forgotten about her femininity. She's wearing a specially knitted woolen hat. Looks like if she has flower decoration on the hat. And I love her decorated collar here. Just an amazing photograph. I've looked at this many, many times. And I keep on thinking, looking at the fall of her dress, that she was probably several months pregnant. But have no idea. Can't verify that at all, obviously. The ironworks were dependent upon the horse-drawn tramroads. The horse-drawn tramroads that ran on flangeless wheels on L-shaped rails. And this is an example of one of them. It's the Penderin tramroad running from the village of Penderin into Hidawine. And these tramroads are wonderful. They're about 120 miles of former tramroad across the heads of the valleys of South Wales. And they're marvelous places to walk because they're built following the contours, and they're very easy to get through to see some magnificent countryside. And it was along one of these tram roads, the Penadaran tram road, <coughs> which ran from Merthyr Tidville to Abercunnan, that the very first steam locomotive in the world ran on rails. It um, ran on February the 21st, 1804, designed by the Cornish engineer, Richard Trevithick. It was such a remarkable achievement, and it opened up eventually, although it didn't happen immediately, but it opened up eventually the whole process of transportation on rails by steam. So such a significant point of history there in uh, the town between Merthyr Tidville and Abercannon. This is a painting by Terence Caneo, who produced, has produced some marvelous, very vivid representations of what the occasions these important historic occasions must have been like. And I love the detailing. Well, there's um, Mr. Trevithick himself, complete with spanner in case of any breakdowns, and there were indeed quite a few of them. There's uh, a carpenter complete with saw to cut away the overhanging branches 
on the uh, rails. And Terence Kinnale, his trademark is a mouse. Every single one of his paintings, you will find a mouse. If you look very, very carefully, I hope it can point it out, there's the mouse in this painting trotting just in front of the, the railway, in front of the locomotive. There are some places that achieved names after the industries that created them, or expanded them, I should say, rather. And this is a view of Swansea. Swansea, Swansea which was known as Copperopolis, because here were melted thousands and thousands of tons of copper in a great line of works up and down the Avon Tower, along uh, Avon Tower, because here coal was available in plentiful <coughs> supply. You had the navigable river, so you had an outlet for your uh, products, and it took round about, it depended on the, the ore, but it took about seven tons of coal to smelt one ton of copper. So that's why places like Swansea developed and evolved into such important centers of industry. I came across a couple of lovely quotes about um, uh, Swansea and Havod, which is now an intensely industrialized area. But in the early 18th century, a local visitor wrote and said, Oh, Havod, thy sweet abode, fit mansion truly for a god. It was such a beautiful place. And yet by 1850, there was another quote which said, it came to pass in days of yore that the devil chanced upon Landor. Quote he from all this fume and stink, I can't be far from home, I think. I can't talk about industry in Wales and ignore coal mining because this was probably the most significant industry in terms of output, volume and economics in the area. And it was these important narrow seams of coal outcropping quite close to the surface and a whole series of seams and going much, much deeper underground. But this high quality coal that you could find in South Wales, varying from anthracite to bituminous coal to very high quality steam coal, that was the attraction. And of course, coal was being mined in the 12th century uh, by the uh, Cistercian monks at Neath, certainly throughout the medieval period. But when we get into the 18th century, we have this really marvelous view of a coal mine near Neath by Paul Sandby, I think it was 1778, which shows the early methods of mining coal or of winding coal rather, horses operating a horse gin, the ropes winding round, going over the winding wheel, dropping into the pit producing the coal, but it's very much a small industry in the middle of a rural landscape. However, by the time you get to the 1870s, between 1870 and 1913, the landscape changed because in 18, round about the 1870s, the uh, Admiralty decided that Welsh smokeless steam coal was the very best stuff to power the steamships of um, the Imperial Empire. And the coal industry took off with a vengeance. And many of these narrow valleys quickly became populated by people, by houses, and the all once familiar surface arrangements and pit heads. Really quite amazing. Just a quick visit underground. This is a photograph that was taken by William Jones, William Edmund Jones of Pontypool in 1905 at a, a naked lights, lights level uh, near called Placicoid near Pontypool. And it's just remarkable because it shows ex exactly what coal mining was about. Right up until well into the 20th century in some mines, coal was still being dug by hand. <coughs> here they are using their pickaxes or mandrills as they were known, and they're cutting out the base of the coal seam to release the pressure so they can bar down the rest of the seam. And you can see the candles, which they had to buy, um, you can see the candles placed in line with the holing to throw light on it. I came across a lovely reference to the buckle that you can see this chap here is wearing on his belt. In some places of the coal field, this was a miner I spoke to in Bargoid, and he said, 
when you started wearing your big brass buckle, it was a sign that you'd been accepted by your workmates as being a top class collier. And it wasn't just a case, like the slate industry, it wasn't just a case of going in with your hammers and your pickaxes and slamming away. Coal mining was a very skilled uh, and very important job. Very, very dangerous job as well. But um, these were skilled craftsmen in their own right. And so these incredible environments were placed. These once narrow valleys, one or two farms up and down the length and breadth of the valleys, there you can actually see one just there on the hillside, was soon overshadowed by these serried ranks of stone and slate as people flooded into the valleys from all parts of rural Wales, from uh, parts of elsewhere in Britain, and from much further afield to find work in the burgeoning coal mines. And these terraces I find deeply fascinating, the way that many of them follow the contours, but some then, such are the pressures on land and space, some cross the contours, like this terrace of houses at Pontegwaith in, um, in between Rondeval and Rondevach, well, Rondevach really. And just amazing, built of stone, quarried from the local hillside, covered, of course, with slate from North Wales, Doors and windows made of brick from the hundreds of brickworks that were dotted across the area. But I love this house, each house having its own platform and then being following this slope with this wonderful sloping, curving roof, a marvelous piece of carpentry in its own right. And the important places of recreation, important pillars for the society like the great Workingmen's Institute, like the marvellous Workmen's Institute at Ogmore Vale, alas, no longer with us. It collapsed back in the 1980s. Very important because here you could go and educate yourselves. They had fantastic libraries, but you also had recreation, snooker halls, theatres, you name it. You had it in these buildings. And of course, alongside, you have chapels and religion, nonconformity, being such a powerful influence in these industrial areas in the 19th and early 20th century. Just to coming to the end, to look at, there are a couple of really very important sites that I find deeply fascinating. This is a aerial I took in 1975 of Abadilice near Neath. An amazing site here because you have the railway, designed by Brunel, running right up the Neath Valley, but that was preceded by the Neath Canal, which you can see in the top of the photograph, running there from the upper reaches of the Neath Valley, bringing in coal, limestone, and powder from the Pont Neerwechen Powder Works, bringing in uh, materials on boats that could carry up to 25 tons of cargo down to Giant's Grave and the Wharfs at Neath. That was opened in 1796, I think. I may be a couple of years out, so forgive me. And then another canal built by George Tennant, who built the Tennant Canal, which connected with the Neath Canal and ran down to Port Tennant near Swansea, so provided another point of outlet for the materials from the hinterland. And this is just incredible. With a large holding basin just here, waiting, the boats waiting their turn to cross this aqueduct and through the lock here and then down on into towards Swansea. This was a site of the tin plate works and this here is a site that we'll look at in just a moment. If you look very carefully you can see that the branch canal runs up here and it ran right up under the road and connected with the site at Aberdillas. The aqueduct is superb it really is a marvelous example of canal <coughs> Um If you haven't yet taken a visit there, I can certainly recommend having a look at the Tennant Canal at Abadillas. And the works at Abadillas, the site of the first copper smelting works in Wales in 1556, established by a German called Ulrich Frosser. And um, he was working for the Mines Royal Company at the time. And the works 
first of all, copper smelting there because, again, there were huge supplies of charcoal available locally to smelt the copper. And, of course, water was flowing over the wonderful Aberdeleis waterfalls. It then became an iron forge. It was then a corn mill. And when it was a corn mill, Turner visited the site and painted a wonderful picture of it. And then, laterally, it became a tin plate works. And it's as a tin plate works, you'll see most of the remains. It's now in the care of the National Trust. And I was responsible for this site. And we took the decision to install a hydroelectric scheme uh, with a turbine and also put a water wheel back in the original water wheel pit. And so we installed this water wheel designed by students from Swansea University, built for us by um, uh, British Steel uh, in their um, workshops. And it drives with water power, generates up to 50 kilowatt of electricity. So tin plate works, we hear laterally, and tin plate working so important to West Wales and Llanelli, as Swansea was called Copperopolis, so Llanelli was called Tinopolis because it was the centre of tin plate manufacturing. But at Kidwelly, you have the earliest extant tin plate works remaining in Britain, dating from 1719. Although the engine you can see here, uh, the original works were powered by water, but these this engine here, this marvelous vertical Foden steam engine, powered the hot rolls and the coal rolls that operated these works. Tin plate manufacture, now that was a tough industry with a vengeance. Um, the tin plate was passed through rolls, squeezed, folded, stamped down by these people using their special protected boots, folded again, reheated, passed through until you produce the very, very fine quality steel, which could then be used for the canning industry and for many other purposes. And again, as with Paris Copper Mountain, these are the works where women work alongside men. And here we can see these photographs are taken in the 1950s at a, uh, a works in Ponte Villas. And here you can see the women holding what we call their hangers. And their hangers were like swords. They were pieces of sword-like steel. And it was their job, because the tin plate had a tendency to stick together, it was their job to then pull apart the tin plate and strike it with the hangers to separate it. And you can see they have protection from uh, rags and gloves. So one of the features I find so fascinating about industry in Wales is that you're never far from the countryside. Regardless of where you are, you can be in the middle of the center of the town or the center of the city, but within a matter of a few minutes drive, um, you can be in some really wonderful countryside. This is just a view of the Kidwelly Tin Plate Works, but it just demonstrates the fact that often surrounding these industrial islands, was this sea of rural countryside. And in this instance, of course, the sea proper, not too far away. I haven't even scratched the surface of industry in Wales because there are so many other subjects to cover, like, of course, railways, the whole history of railway transportation in Wales and the engineering that was required to cross the narrow valleys, etc., is just absolutely astonishing. This is the viaduct at King Hogdi near Llandavery. Lighthouses, these beacons that were so important to enable shipping to come into the ports of Wales and carry away the materials that have been produced here. Corn milling, my goodness, here's a subject in its own right. Corn and woolen milling, places like the wonderful tidal mill, the last one on its original site in Wales and one of only four left in the whole of Britain. Uh, but the tidal mill here, with its fantastic undershot water wheels that powered the, the stones and the hoists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lime burning. Now that was so vitally important because, in addition, in addition to lime being used in the iron industry and for building, it was also an important fertilizer for um, agriculture. And here we have this amazing set of lime kilns at Llandebir, uh, not far from Ammanford.
and the subject of bridges. Well, again, bridges in Wales, that's a, <laughs> that's a lecture in its own right. They're really very, very important. This is a bridge that was designed by William Edwards, the builder of the bridge at pont although this one is at Kilocum near Sandavri. And then finally, I'd just like to pay tribute to the fact that you can talk about your iron furnaces, your slate quarries, this, that, your bridges, etc. Of course, everything requires the terrific skills and knowledge of the work people. It didn't matter if you were, uh, were a humble laborer in an ironworks like this detail from the William Childs painting of the Dallas Ironworks. You had your own skills, you had your own techniques, you had your own challenges. And I find it amusing that so very often uh, you hear people saying, oh, you can't find the craftspeople today, they just don't exist. Well, of course they do. And you only have to go to a men's shed to find them because these craftspeople are still around. Here are a couple. I'm uh, a great fan of um, the squirrel's nest in Tondi. Wonderful set of blokes there. And um, here are a couple of them actually making beautiful, beautiful musical instruments. So skills, techniques, enthusiasm, they're still with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the um, problems we had kicking off this morning, but I hope You've enjoyed the um, the short presentation, and thank you all for watching on behalf of Men Sheds covering.